Uh, okay, so for my midterm project, I decided to research and write about Mary Bradley Lane and her novel, uh, Mazura, uh, and just kind of talking about who Mary Bradley Lane was and how exactly her feminist and socialist novel fits into that sort of uh, late 19th century feminist conversation. Um, finding information on Mary Bradley Lane was really hard because her biography was kind of just lost to history like there just wasn't very much information about her whatsoever but after some digging I did find some um but yeah so let me share my screen hold on one second I don't think it's this one okay let's present no 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 so who exactly is Mary Bradley Lane? Uh, well, this is a bit of a difficult question to answer. Uh, just about any and every source you can find, any papers written about her, any presentations, they all seem to mention how very little is known about her life and who she was, aside from her being born on July 3rd, 1844, and that she's the author of the second recorded ever just totally female utopian novel. Uh, this information, or lack thereof, seems pretty disheartening. Um, why doesn't anybody know anything about this mysterious woman, and is she mysterious, or is her story just sort of lost to history? Um, well, here's what we do know. Uh, according to a few old and scattered newspaper clippings and articles here and there, we have a few small pieces of concrete information, like we know that Missouri was first copyrighted under the name Mary Bradley in 1890. Uh, we know that in the 1975 Greg publishing edition listed the author as Mary E. Bradley Lane, finally adding uh, her married last name to it. Um, we know that in the first edition copy of in the Library of Congress, Lane has been appended to the author's surname in pencil. And we know that besides Mazora, Mary Bradley Lane, under the pseudonym of Vera Zerovich, <laughs> which will come up later, um, published a short story in the Cincinnati Gazette entitled The Magic Lens. Um, and here's our glimmer of hope. It's Jean Felzer, and I don't know if that's how you pronounce her last name, but that's how I'm going to pronounce it for this presentation. Um, so while Mary Bradley Lane remains almost completely mysterious to almost everyone else, um, there is one person who managed to find a good bit of the puzzle that is our mysterious author's life, and that is Jean Felzer. And she is somewhat the foremost expert of Mary Bradley Lane, uh, having written one monograph on the utopian novel, one book chapter on Mazora, and the introduction to Syracuse's 2000 edition of Mazora, uh, Felzer provides us with the most detailed biography that we can find of Mary E. Bradley Lane in that introduction. Uh, and here's the introduction. It says, we can only wonder why Mary Ellen Bradley Lane, born July 3rd, 1844 to 1920-something, uh, wrote such a trenchant anti-male satire within three years of her marriage. Lane was the daughter of Eliza Jane Mackay Bradley and Jacob Bradley, a rural doctor who served as a staff physician for the Union Army. She was raised in the village of St. Mary's, which is now located in Alglaze County, Ohio. Uh, for a time, she taught at a public school in Mercer County, boarding with a local family until in September of 1878, she married Thomas A. Lane, a Cincinnati attorney and Civil War veteran whom she had met when she was 10 years old. At the time of her marriage, she was 34 and he was 44. They immediately moved to Cincinnati where he practiced law and within a few years they moved to Mount Healthy, a village outside of Cincinnati and later to a farm four miles from a nearby village, Transit. The author of a tale organized around the sentiments, wisdom, and responsibilities of motherhood, Lane had no children of her own. Apparently she wrote only one other book entitled Escanaba uh, in 1895 and it was named after a town in Michigan, uh, but no other copy can be located. Thomas Lane died in 1908, and Mary repeatedly wrangled with the federal government over her small widow's pension, uh, suggesting that money was a serious concern. She died near transit sometime after 1928, the last time I can place her. Uh, so this is the aftermath of a little known woman. Uh, we don't even know the date of Mary Bradley Lane's death, although the online science fiction encyclopedia claims it's January 6, 1930. Uh, we also don't know how much of her work 
don't know much of her work besides Mazora, so gauging its popularity is pretty difficult. Um, we do know that it achieved popularity within at least the literary circles of Cincinnati and the Ohio River Valley, um, who were able to access it as readers of the Cincinnati Commercial Gazette, which is where she often published those short stories. Um, and we see this in this 1881 letter to the editor of the newspaper dated January 31st. Uh, to the editor of the commercial, has the narrative of Vera Zarevich been published in book form, and if so, where can I get it, and what is the price? Address and oblige J.W. Franks, Cornersville, Marshall County, Tennessee. That remarkable narrative has never been published in any form other than that in which it appears in the columns of the commercial. It will, we presume, be published in book form. Uh, and this is the editor's response. Uh, that is not the only instance of Vera Zera which receiving fan letters addressed to the editor, and it's perhaps the many letters such as those that prompted him to write the following quote in the introduction to the first edition of Mazora. Um, the narrative of Vera Zera which attracted a great deal of attention. It commanded a wide circle of readers, and there was much more said about it than, it's than is usual for works of fiction when they run through a newspaper in weekly installments. Quite a number of persons who are unaccustomed to bestowing consideration upon the works of fiction spoke of it and grew greatly interested in it. I received many messages about it and letters of inquiry, and some ladies and gentlemen desired to know the particulars about the production if, of the story in book form. So why don't we remember it? Uh, the original popularity of Mazora is also like debated and guessed at by some scholars writing either on the book or online. Uh, according to Seagal, uh, despite Halstead, which is the the editor of the the newspaper, uh, his pre-publication hype in the introduction of the 1890 edition, beyond what commercial editor Murat Halstead called our limited literary world of presumably Cincinnati or the Ohio Valley, uh, the novel apparently created no stir once it was reprinted. Few original copies survive, and Mary Lane remains a comparatively unfamiliar name to scholars of American history, literature, and feminism. Belzer, however, describes the book as having risen to popularity somewhat, um, and this is kind of corroborated by one of the reviewers who described the sales of the book as extraordinary, but that's kind of the only premise to go on. There's no, like, sales proof, you know, no proof of purchase. Um, Unfortunately, around the same time as the first publication of Mazora, the arguably much more successful and recognized utopian novel of the time, which was Looking Backwards by Edward Bellamy, was also published, effectively shunting Mazora under the rug of the collective consciousness. Like, nobody really thought about it after that. Um, and this prompted complete outrage from the forgotten author, enough for her to immediately call plagiarism on Bellamy, claiming she had submitted her novel to Houghton Milfin first and that they kept it just long enough to copy its plot and publish it under a different name with a different author. She soon became the laughing stock of the literary community, though not without some biased support from her fellow Cincinnatians, though all in all her claims were completely disregarded. Uh, as we can see in this little newspaper clipping, a woman, Vera Zarevich, accuses Edward Bellamy of plagiarism, saying that the idea in Looking Backward was worked out by her in a serial story published in the Cincinnati Commercial Gazette eight years ago. But the essential idea under dispute is older by 19 centuries than either Mr. Bellamy or Vera Zarevich, and to support her charge, the latter must show her plan to elaboration her plan of elaboration has been copied by looking backwards, which of course she does not do. Mr. Bellamy has never claimed anything more than the new use of the old idea, and that is unquestionably his. Uh, so now what exactly is Mazora? Uh, for starters, its full title is quite a mouthful. It is Mazora, a prophecy, a manuscript found among the private papers of Princess Vera Zarevich being a true and faithful account of her journey to the interior of the earth with a careful description of the country and its inhabitants, their customs, manners, and government. After being exiled from her home and family, Vera Zarevich, sound familiar, finds herself in Mazora, a civilization at the center of the earth made up entirely of women. The novel recounts her experiences there and what she learns during the time in this utopian civilization. Uh, the book depicts an all-female utopia existing within the earth. Uh, the Mazorians practice eugenics. All of them are Aryan presenting and disdain people of darker skin. Uh, of course, by these standards and with retrospect in our corner, we know now just about inherently racist the novel is as a whole, uh, but it's simply a product of its time, in my opinion. 
uh, Missouri's history follows loosely, but almost exactly um, that of America's history in which society, which particularly men, dissolves following a bloody civil war raging amongst the men who end up destroying themselves during and after the battles are finished. Um, in its ancient history, the land was ruled by a military general elected president, which is just a version of Ulysses S. Grant. Um, and when the general ran for a third term, as Grant was urged to do in 1880, the Society of Missouri descended into chaos, and eventually a new all-female society order arose. Uh, the last men were eliminated, though it's not really clear whether they were overtly killed or just kind of left to die out. Um, but it's said that men are more forgotten than hated, like they just didn't really need them at all. Uh, so who, but who is exactly Vera Zarevich, aside from a pseudonym in which Mary Lane uh, published under? Uh, throughout the novel, not only is their ideas pulled from American history, but also that of like oppressive czarist Russian history. Uh, the main character, who is Vera Zarevich, is a young political fugitive who has kind of fallen out of favor uh, within the czarist regime and has been sentenced to exile in Siberia. Um, she ends up in Missouri through a stroke of fate when her kayak, which is bound northward, is swept up into a waterfall leading straight to the center of the earth and down into Missouri. She spends 15 years there learning the ways of the culture, and at the end of the time, she longs to return to her husband and child and to teach her own society what she's learned. Although Vera ultimately manages to return to her own society, her husband and son are dead, and a Missourian friend also dies, so she's lost a lot at that point, and she's left only with the hope that future generations will be better off um, through the promises of universal education and the deeply questionable practices of eugenics. And at the very least, at least the main character understands how problematic uh, eugenics, eugenist ideas are, um, even if the entire novel is centralized around them. Okay, so now, now that we've looked at Mary Bradley Lane and finally learned a little bit about her, and we've discussed the plot and details of the novel, but like, what does it really say when looked at and compared within the larger late 19th century feminist ideology? Like, where does it fall within those bigger conversations? Uh, well, let's look quickly at those details of the feminist and socialist utopia again. Um, its citizens want for nothing. They have everything they could ever need at their fingertips. Um, all, manu all manual labor is fully mechanical, which is a pretty like hefty like wish, <laughs> especially considered where he considering where we are like right now in the 21st century, nothing's fully mechanical yet, not really, um, not in the way that she predicts it will be. Um, agriculture is no longer used, like food is created from the elements, like bread comes from limestone, for example, um, and universal education has been made available for all. So it sounds great, right? Sure, but we can't forget that every utopia is somebody's dystopia, and in this case it should be every sane modern person's dystopia, especially when we take a look at this, like why to fear this kind of future. Um, Vera Zarevich finds herself constantly asking where all the men are in her new home, but is quickly taught that men are as undesirable as brunettes or dark-skinned people or criminals, all of whom have been, as Vera's tutors very calmly and simply explain, um, eliminated. Uh, Jean Felser summarizes the book best yet again, and this is why we call her the expert and not me. Um, socialist and feminist, it may be, but Mizora also delivers a racist and imperialistic destiny, not only is in its political promises, but also in its narrative of discovery and initiation. So again, we ask, how does this fit in with larger conversations about feminism and evolution in the late 19th century among women thinkers like that? Uh, according to Wendy Hayden, who is a rhetoric rhetorician, rhetor yes, <laughs> uh, in her dissertation, she talks about women's rights advocates using scientific development in fields such as bacteriology, physiology, embryology, and heredity um, as warrants to really help boost their claims of like truly free love spared from judgment within that feminist ideology. So her summary of this deep-rooted crossing between eugenics and feminism in that time period is the best that I was able to find. Uh, she, sta she states, but using an appeal to mothers of the race led to other developments. A rhetoric feminist 
A rhetoric of feminist eugenics. In earlier texts, the type of eugenics advocated is the more positive kind. Uh, feminists asserted a woman's right to choose a partner that would help her bear more fit offspring. Uh, many rights could be advocated under this line of argument though. And however, towards the late 19th century, eugenic discourses became more racist and more deterministic. Later, feminists advocated for eugenics instead of using eugenic arguments for feminist ends, creating arguments that championed more negative eugenics than positive eugenics. Um, and it became an end rather than the means to argue for feminist reforms. Uh, of course, not all late 19th century feminists supported or endorsed eugenic ideals, but they were very clearly and very heavily used in relation to each other, especially in that time period. And thanks to Hayden, we sort of see that, we sort of understand that. Um, while some late 19th century feminist thinkers were developing ideas about evolutionary biology and purely deploying them for feminist goals, many were coupling those findings into evolutionary biology with those eugenist theories to argue for the feminist goals. So in conclusion, while Mazora and by association its author detailed a world in which women thrived and succeeded without the help of any man or dependence on fossil fuels or anything like that, all while providing universal education and healthcare, we see now how extremely flawed the means of those successes are, as nice as they may sound. Um, yes, while the inherent ideas of women's freedoms within the novel like did so much for the feminist ideology of the time, many of those women pushing for those freedoms either didn't understand the severity of the eugenics roots or agreed with them, and thus providing a great framework for us now in the 21st century to see and understand exactly how far we've come from that, and I think that that's really great. Like, no, it's not necessarily um, applicable anymore, of course, but it it lets us see, like, it lets us not repeat those means, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs>